Okay. In this first segment, and you can see that, we're going to talk about the importance of maintaining correct engine oil and transmission fluid levels. Now look at this handout <coughs> and see if you can see your questions. See your questions in there? All right. What? What? Huh? It's right there. All right, driving with low levels of transmission fluid could call. Now let's see what we get. I say, here we go. I see any time a vehicle is driven with too little or too much engine oil or transmission fluid, a number of things can go wrong. <laughs> too little engine oil will lead to internal engine problems. Now, that's a simplistic thing to say. I've said this before in here. I'm going to say it again. If you've got an engine that's supposed to take five quarts of oil and it gets a quart low, if that oil ordinarily would have lasted, you know, three to 5,000 miles, four quarts of oil and a five-quart crankcase will break down in half the time. You're going to cut the life of that oil in half even though it's only one quart low. You know, you'd finally feel like if it was supposed to go, you know, let's say it, for every 100 miles you would be able to go with five quarts, you ought to be able to go 80 miles with four, but anyway it is. It gets contaminated real fast when, it, when the oil gets low. Now, what about too much oil? It, foam in the tank. it can, but i tell you something else it can cause. I got a dadgum ranger one time. That yeah, what? A ranger that, that was on the, uh, at the Ford place that they gave me to work on. And this thing had a vibration that was just awful. <laughs> just, you'd think a harmonic balancer was coming apart on there or something. And, uh, but it had been over to an oil change place or something. And they put eight quarts of oil in the crankcase. And so I pulled the dipstick and it was way off up the dipstick. And it wasn't because it had anything but oil in there. And the oil was new. And so I got under it and I drained out three quarts of oil so it was all five quarts and it was smooth. All the vibration was well, well, I don't know, unless at the uh, crankcase, you know, the it, was the it was having to move it too much. So too much oil was causing it to slow the crankshaft down or something. I don't know. I can't even explain that. But I do know that all that was wrong with that truck was it had three quarts too much oil. Was it smoking? No, it should have been, I thought. But I, that was the only indication I had that it was anything besides the dipstick. The only indication I had was a really bad engine vibration. Now, the, the thing that throws people about doing car work is that uh, everybody has an idea that they want to be able to say, if you do this, this will always happen. And on, on this thing right here, you would think if it was full of oil, and you would think, I mean, if it was too much oil, that you'd see it smoking or something would happen. But I didn't see none of that. All I saw was a vibration on that truck. Now, the next time you see this, you might have something else. You may be smoking, or it may work on it. Every, every engine is different. Sometimes two different vehicles with the same engine in them will act slightly different, you know. But um, well, what I wanted to say, it's like that time I was talking about that, uh, I mean, that a Malibu that woman had gone all over uh, town trying to get it worked on, and it. Wouldn't hardly pull. Wouldn't hardly go on 40 miles an hour, and it had too much transmission fluid in it. Now, usually, if a transmission's got too much fluid in it, it will push the transmission fluid out the vent, and it'll look like you got a big leak. Now, you remember also what I told you about your your transmission um, on that, uh, huh? The, yeah, the transmission um, when you put your if you're driving on a on a uh, Interstate, and let's say that you're up there in St. Louis or something. There's a traffic jam that keeps you sitting out there, and you know, in traffic for yeah, two and a half, three hours. If you've got your transmission and drive in the traffic, e ease it along. That torque converter shearing that fluid the whole time with, is going to heat the transmission up, and it's liable to ball fluid out the vent. Yeah, boy. See what I mean? Yeah. All right, so you got to be careful about. Hey, we got this Mexican's car in the <laughs> shop. <laughs> Mexican, he's a oh, Puerto Rican. Okay. We put a brand new pump on it. It's a it's in a eighty four. Brand new what kind of pump? Power steering pump. Okay. Uh, so I think an eighty four cutlass two door something. Yeah. And the engine come out of a ninety seven. Wow. Yeah. It's carbureted. Mm-hmm. And it's got some kind of rigged up. What kind of car is it? Some kind of cutlass. Cutlass oh. Supreme. Yes, that's exactly what it is. <laughs> yeah. A two door. I know what you're talking about. Now, what what engine is it? What a three eight three point eight or something? Don't know. Hey, is it a ninety seven model? Would have to be. A, is it a four cylinder or a V six? No, it's a V eight. A V eight. Yeah, come on. It's some kind of V eight. I don't know what it is. We don't know what it is. He just shoved a motor in there and yeah. somehow got it running. Okay. And 
Okay, we put a brand new tire scanner pump on it because it was leaking like crazy around the seal. You know, you can't get just the seal anymore. We, we tried. Put that on there and it started leaking around the neck now. Mm -hmm. And he wants us to make it right. Yeah. Because of time. So I don't know what he said. You can't understand how it. Well, I mean, if you, you know, if you worked on the power steering and now it's leaking somewhere else, you know, technically you can get right. a tendency. Right, I mean, we did. We yeah. told him, we said, look, we could do this and do that. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and he's like, look, we, 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 we've done everything. <laughs> well, <laughs> we've done everything we can. Well, you got a communication problem. You know, some of the people, the, the foreign exchange students and stuff, they come, uh, everything they point at under the hood, they call motor. Motor, motor, yeah, they motor. may be pointing to the power steering pump or they may be pointing to the wiper motor or something like that. But it's hard to communicate with those people and tell what it is that you want to do. But um, you just have to have a translator, you know. Well, they did. He had, there was a translator there. Yeah. And we were like, look, we just put it on there. I think it could have had an air bubble in it. Yeah. And Probably. It may have been like boiling the fluid, pushing that air out, making yeah, a foam. Yeah, it was boiling the fluid. Now, you know what we were talking about doing on a power steering system is putting vacuum on the reservoir and turning it back and forth with the wheels up off the ground. That'll, that'll purge the air out of it sometimes. But, you know, we put that little uh, fluid trap, like what goes with your vacuum pump. Right. So I hook that, uh, make a little uh, cap of some kind that will seal good and tight so that you're lowering the pressure inside there above the fluid. Right. And then uh, put the other end of that hose, go, let, go through your little your fluid trap, and the engine vacuum and let the engine run and they turn the wheels back and forth. A lot of times you get that air out of there. Right? And anyway, um, that uh, look at what you got here. Uh, in, internal engine components got increased friction and heat if it's... Uh, oh, yeah. hold on, hold on. Okay. Oh, okay. One thing about it. Okay, I was working on, remember the Nissan was putting in here? Yeah. Okay. Now I was working on another one. You remember the current sensor? Yeah. How did we get it off? Oh, the crank sensor? It was bare. It's way down there. Yeah, I mean, I know where it is, yeah. but what was the connector was weird. What oh, yeah, do? yeah. That connector is, uh, it's it works backwards of what you think it is. Right. You've got to pull that little green thing. you got to push that green thing down and pinch it or something. Yeah. Uh, I practiced on that a little bit, and uh, well, I think I've got one of those connectors out there we can fool with. Yeah. But it's it's fun. <laughs> I don't remember if it was pulled I know, out it's tricky as all get out. And uh, if you've done a lot of those, you know, people at Nissan Place go snap, snap, click, click, and it's not a problem. Yeah. But I got one out here on a sensor that we can look at and all that if you want to. But uh, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Uh, but the, uh, and I don't know if Michael had heard of that before, but I had one of them that was giving me the wrong pattern. You just swear the engine was out of time, and all I did was put a different sensor in it, the pattern was right, and then the truck. Yeah, that's what's wrong with this one, it, yeah. it only does it every certain time. Yeah. And uh, sometimes on those you unplug the cam sensor and they'll fire up and this kind of stuff. Then yeah. sometimes they may not. And it's just crazy as I'll get out of the work. Uh, oil can't circulate properly. And engine components are subjected to increased friction and heat. Okay? You don't want to accelerate your engine wear. You know, accelerating your engine is good, but accelerating engine wear is not, right? Uh, so low engine oil levels, you got to hear noises. What kind of noises? Like what Brandon's hearing? What are you hearing on the Jeep? Click, click, no, Clackety, no. clackety, clack. It sounds more like a daggum. You know, like old bicycles where they put a card in it for it to sound cool? That's what it sounds like, but it's like when you go faster, it's like it's louder. Like yeah. more of a hammer. Mm -hmm. Like an all peen hammer now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's... Like tapping it really fast? Yeah, it's different. The, the quality of the sound changes when you're going faster, like it's a harder mm -hmm. knock or something. A low oil can result in the connecting rod or main bearing wrapping or knocking. Um, okay, you got to put about transmission fluid in it. Now, if it's got transmission fluid low... You might notice a delayed engagement when you place in reverse. You crank it up, you put it in gear, it sits there for a second, and it goes dunk. You typically got a little fluid. You got that? Yep. Everybody remember that. Whenever I first started working on cars, every time I learned another what, a, what a, another, another symptom meant, I would always try to store that in my memory. Hold on, man. What? And that was one of the first things I learned was when you put a transmission in here in the morning, and it would sit there and then go thunk. If you check the fluid, there. it was always low. All right. Yeah, he might be. Who is that? Is that Sean? Sean was out here. He said he's supposed to bring his Tahoe, and his brother was probably going to tow it in on a Toyota. And there's that blazer out there. I don't know what's it. I don't understand exactly what he brought that for. He did um, a couple of Oh, months. he said he was going to leave because some crack kid was going to steal yeah. something out the inside. He <laughs> <laughs> met his aunt's son. His aunt's son. She's in the hospital. She has a massive heart attack, and his aunt's son has been breaking into her house and stealing stuff. Yeah. 
and there was some speculation about like, him breaking in the blazer or whatever, so he brought it up here and locked it up. But I told him yesterday not to leave the park down there. Did you see where it's at? Yeah, well, it, no, nobody bothers anything out here, you know, really. Yeah. Really? But anyway, uh, this can also create noises from inside the transmission. Uh, if you've got low fluid and the yeah. stuff's not being lubricated, okay, you know what? Transmission could fail to engage at all. But. That up there says um, for the, the, uh, the reverse and drive, but on the answers, uh, the answers you've got reverse and load. Would that be the same one? I no. would I would say that works because when you put it in drive when you put it in drive what gear are you going in there? Oh uh, my bad, I'm blind this morning. Cigarette amateur. All right. Now if uh, as always you got to add or replace fluids, you got to make sure you use the right kind. Don't be an idiot. Yeah. Now, now we had a little discussion about zero W zero W fluid, right? Zero W thirty, zero W twenty. This old man wanted to put twenty W fifty. I mean, 20W50 in his van. What van is it? Current caravan. <laughs> I mean, what year is it? <laughs> like a 2005. Oh, pour it in there. Be right. For a little while. Yeah, no, I, I don't hurt it. I mean, I, I mean, what I'm saying is now some of the new stuff, if it's like those, the forge with the three valves and those, uh, this cam time and stuff, you, you got to put exactly right down in here. Uh, but if he wants 20 W50 and he tells you to put that in there, pour it in there. Oh, yeah, we we'll yeah. put it in there. Yeah, they ain't hurt it. They ain't, I mean, I used I used to use 20 W50 in every darn thing I had. Why? You know, just More because water. I like better. I like the oil pressure. You know, but like I say, you can't do that on the stuff. If it's got if it's got these little tiny orifices, it's got to go through to make the uh, valve stuff work and all that. Like some of these Hondas and all that. You the, you can't just indiscriminately pour it in everything. But if it's just a plain old motor with, you know, with aluminum heads and, a, and rocker arms and a timing chain, and it's, you know, like that air van is, you can pour whatever you want to in there, 2050, 1040, whatever. In this part of the country, 2050 ain't hurting a doggone thing. In it. They want the, the real thin oils typically, and this is my take on it. You know, some people might disagree. A lot of people, you know, will argue with you about oil till the, till they're blue in the face. A lot of people still think the W and you know five W thirty or whatever stands for wheat when it actually stands for winter. Mm -hmm. But anyhow, this uh, the oil, uh, yeah, all of this oil has got to meet standards. Right. You know, and I was, uh, and you can actually. Uh, you, there was a time when people you say, well, you're not supposed to mix the oil. You got to put the same kind in there. that was in there before and all that. You know. Now I tell you that when I don't deviate. Uh, if uh, if I get a vehicle in here like that Chrysler Crossfire, and it says it takes nine quarts of full synthetic. Cadillac Escalade, I'm not Escalade, it was a Cadillac, not that crossover, whatever example it was, uh, that we worked on. The, uh, the fluid looked like old brake fluid. <laughs> it didn't smell nor look like transmission fluid. It was a, it was black, it was kind of clear. You, you swear you got out of the master builder, and it was terrible, and we flushed it, you know, and made it put, got all new fluid in it and everything. But anyway, did it work right? Uh, well, I'll say that again. Well, it worked right when we drove it, but they said occasionally it would still do stuff wrong. But I told them, I said, we can put a transmission in it if you want us to, you know. They never, they never brought it back over here, but most of that runs real good. They don't drive it a whole lot for some strange reason. Kind of like we, we put a shock in it. All right. So, now listen, here's your six step troubleshooting procedure. Now, I, got you, I, got, I want you guys to burn this in because it's really important. Verification of complaint. How many of you know you're supposed to verify your complaint? What does that mean? They said, my, truck, my car skips when it's going down the road. So you, you take the doggone car and you drive it down the road and see if it skips. The more information you can get, the better off you are. 
what speed does it skip at? Does it skip when it's hot? Does it skip when it's cold? Does it only skip when it's raining? Does it make any difference, you know, if it's day or night? If you ask any question you can possibly think of asking, you write it all down. Your service advisor may not do that if you work in a dealership. They may not ask them a question. Sometimes you got to go up first and call this guy back and ask him if blah, 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 blah. Verification of related symptoms, okay? What do I mean by that? Anything else that you see wrong? See what I'm saying? Like here's an example right here. Let's see the ABS light is on on a GM car, right? I got an ABS light on, and I'm also hearing a noisy bearing in the right front. In my mind, those two situations are probably related. Wheel speed sensor. The wheel speed sensor is built into that bearing on that one, and it's probably going to have wiped out. You know, the noisy bearing is wiped out the sensor and all that. Uh, symptom analysis. What you're going to do then is you're going to take your symptoms and you're going to say, if I'm hearing noise over here and my ABS light is on, then I've probably got things over here. And now let's go to the, you know, scan tool here and isolate the problem. And we're going to look it up. And our right front sensor, sure enough, is not putting out. The noise is coming from up there. Let's work on that noise and see when we replace the hub, we're going to be replacing the sensor at the same time. Okay, you're going to repair the isolated problem, and then you got to go back and verify proper operation. Now, invariably, when you're working where somebody else is having to run blocker between you and the customer, and they're going to say, you're going to go in here, and you're going to go as far as you can go with your diagnosis until you've made your repair. They're going to say, I know it needs this, and I know it needs this. Because you've already done your test, you've already know these parts are bad, you're not guessing, you're not saying, well, I think I'm going to throw a throttle position sensor and see that what it does. You've actually done the sweep, and you've seen it drop out. And you know for a fact, just throw me a code for a TP sensor. I've checked the wires. I've actually operated the throttle position sensor on my bolt meter in there, and I've seen it drop out. And it's going to have to have a throttle position sensor. And you know what your service writer is going to say? Is that going to fix it? They want you to tell them before you've done the repair if it's going to need anything else. There's no way you can do that. You know what I mean? And I've actually had customers talk, you know, talk that smack too. You know, work on a vehicle that was falling apart. Because they hadn't hooked the hood on it in two years, you know. And you clean the sledge out of the throttle body. You replace an idle air control valve. You get all this stuff. You get the PCB system working right. You get it purring like a kitten. And the guy drives it. And the, the, on the older, older trucks, like 89 and older, they had a fuel pump in the tank and a fuel pump on the frame on these Fords. And so I did all this stuff that needed to be done under the hood that hadn't been touched, you know, for a long time. And you could see, look at the parts. It was all junk. Everything that needed to be done. The guy comes back over there and he said, hey, my, car, my truck is acting up again. So I checked it again and I found out that sometimes the pump in the gas tank wasn't running. And if that pump quits running, in a lot of cases you'll lose the prime to the big pump and then it'll cause it to button jump and cut out or my ear first all and not start and all that. And so I said, okay, you're going to have to have that pump in the tank and a partial labor is going to be about $275. And he said, well, you said all this other stuff is going to fix my truck. Can you tell me this fuel pump is going to fix it? Well, I can tell you it needs the fuel pump. I mean, that's all I can tell you right now. You know. And it's one guy coming with a tire from diesel. And he says, I put a set of injectors in it because it was dialing rough and cutting up. And, you know, I've changed all, put injectors in it and all that kind of stuff. And he said, well, I'm not going to have any more trouble with it. And I said, nope, you'll never even need as much as an oil change as long as you drive a truck. You just keep it on the road. Never come back to the shop again forever more. He said, I don't believe that. And I said, well, what do you expect me to say? <laughs> and, uh, you know, he, said, he wanted me to guarantee we never have any more trouble with it. You know, you, you can't do that. I mean, because it's a mechanical thing. You can do the best you can with what you got. Don't put them out with a problem, you know. You know. Uh, here's an example the other day. The uh, the one that we drove, I put the fuel pressure gauge on it, on that still light blue crown mix, and it was cutting up losing power. You would wouldn't you, aren't you? You see the fuel pressure drop off and all that. And it would cut up and everything. So uh, I went, we had done some ignition system stuff on it, too, because it was throwing this fire codes and all that. But I uh, put a fuel filter on it. The old third was kind of clogged. And so uh, we drove it again the same way on the same course. And the pressure was strong the whole way. But when you drive it farther, like on a long trip, it still loses power on hills sometimes. You know what I mean? Now you can actually go completely crazy and say, well, I'm going to replace everything from the radiator all the way back to the tail out. There shouldn't be more trouble if it's going to be $28,000. You know, I can get to it. Just trying to surgically repair it. You know, why put a fuel pump in it if you don't need it? But as it turned out, Chelsea had to put a fuel pump in it yesterday. All right, so we, would, we should have done that to start with on that state plan. Anyway. But in this case, there's some type of fluid dripping under the vehicle, so you know at least there. So before you look for the leak, you want to see what it is that's leaking, whether it's engine oil, transmission fluid, and so forth. 
Right. All right. Look at the work order. Any mention of fluid level history. Now, like I say, in the last couple of years, four or five, six times I've been in there with transmission fluid flow. See that? I'm thinking there's probably something more than what we're looking at there. Um, well, transmission yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, that's going to correspond to the second step of the six step troubleshooting procedure as verify related symptoms. The third step, analyze. Don't do what you got to do. You got to look at the fluid that you've discovered on the ground. Have you ever seen fluid on the ground and you just swear it was something that it turned out not to be? The brand new vehicle, sometimes a little bit of water that comes out in the exhaust when you first start it. You know how a car puts a little water out in the exhaust when you first start it? And before the thing heats up, that water turns into steam. I've actually seen brand new exhaust system drip water out in the pipe that was green. And you swear it was anywhere. Why? Because it was stuff from the inside of the pipe when they made it. And just the little green stuff washing out there. I mean, it's a new truck now. I'm talking about a truck that's in the line. What's funny about that? Yeah. That's funny that you're yep. All right. All right. Sometimes you can identify the fluid linking by its color, but you can't always depend on that as a positive ID, can, can you? Why? Because sometimes the fluid's dark and ugly, isn't it? All right. Engine oil is usually amber or black, while transmission fluid is red. Now, engine oil is not usually amber unless it's brand new oil. Uh, and if it's a diesel, it's probably not going to be amber either. It's going to be real dark color. Transmission Discolored with age, vehicle mileage, and uh, some of the fluids are used from vehicle to vehicle, same color. So there you go. So down the location of the leak can narrow it down. If it's coming from the power steering pump, it's probably not engine oil. Right? If it's dripping from the transmission oil pan gasket, it's probably not going to be engine oil either. Is there a ball of that? All right now, Chelsea, where did we find my where did we find my Jeep leaking the other day? Oil pan. Bring back oil pan. Put the dye in there, shine the light up in there, and it was trickling down. Right? Well, okay. don't know. Put oil pan gasket on there. All right, if you're not sure what fluid is looking at it, smell it. Engine oil was had almost no odor. That's what I was talking about. Sometimes engine oil smell like gas. You know why? Because it gets more and more contaminated with gas the older the vehicle gets. I mean, the older the oil gets, rather. Um, you got to look at it, check the viscosity. If you've got the fluid on the ground, if it's kind of if the oil is kind of thick, you know, like engine oil is, instead of being thin like transmission fluid. Okay, you got the let's see here we go. That particular you know, engine, the location of it. That's what I'm talking about. The picture there. See the picture. And the uh, leak is engine oil. Engine oil is thicker. Vehicles that have a 42 LE transmission use an additional oil called gear and axle lubricant. It's brown. Uh oh, brown. look at there. Brown. It's got okay. brown fluid. It is a dual sump transaxle automatic transmission fluid used in the transmission of the gear and axle lubricants used in the differential. Wow. That's kind of similar vaguely to the Toyota Camry, isn't it? Okay. Yeah. Think about that now. Remember, this is driveline class. I'm going to tell you about this. Those Toyotas, if you've got CV axle seals leaking, and it can let that sump, I mean, that uh, gear box will dry even if the dipstick shows you full of fluid and you can burn that sucker up. All right, if you notice any fluid differential build up near the differential vent, you want to refer to a recently published TSB, which is not so recent now because it's spread out not all the heat. All right. All right, now, uh, what's your next question, by the way? Um, uh, 4.7 liter engine, I don't know, leak, what's the following? Leak point should be. Look at here. Uh, look at that 4.7 that they're talking about. There. 4.7 liter engine used in Grand Cherokee. The checkpoints will vary according to the engine. And that's a 4.7. It's the same motor that you and uh, uh, Brandon worked on. And you know that engine is, doesn't really have as much oil pressure even now as it should have. But he doesn't mind the sound of it because it seems to sound pretty good, so he's just driving. Huh. So burns or... I don't know how it's going to do this summer, but I told him, I said, hey, something, that, that engine's got losing oil pressure somewhere on the inside. I guess Brandon can pull it back out with him next semester for this engine. All right. <laughs> Next, check the area around the PCE hose. Uh, there's no ring on that particular one, and that could be bad. So check for leaks around the cylinder head cover. I'll tell you something that's really dumb. Um, is when you go and do a bunch of hard work, and then you find out the leak was in a different spot, and it was real simple to fix. Um, now I told you about that uh, that car that went to uh, Tallahassee down there, George Bowman's daughter. And uh, she went to that shop, and they said, the rear main sill's leaking, it'll be $1,000. And so he's, George said, well, let's go look at it at school. So we brought it up here. 
And uh, we cleaned everything up real good. We put dye in it. And it was leaking from the corner of the cylinder head. And it was running down the transmission. It looked like it was rear main seal. But what does the shop do in that kind of case, Wes? What they typically do is they change the rear main seal. And then it's just like it was, just like it was. And then they say, well, we got some of the oil leak, but we didn't get it all. Now we got a full head. <laughs> the best thing to do is put the dye in there, or you can spray some Dr. Scholl's foot powder on it, and then see what where the black comes from. Yeah, that's what you, you ever think of that? Yes, you just paint it white with Dr. Scholl's foot powder, where the oil is coming from, and you'll, you'll see it. You know? <laughs> yeah. Dr. Scholl's pretty good. Yeah. Well, now we have full time to build all that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. All right. So. <laughs> All right. Think still ain't that bad. Yeah. Well, this is what gets me is the people will say, take it over there and let them hook it up to the machine and tell them what's wrong with it. Get it? Go find an oil leak. Excuse me. It's just not. But you know that place in Tallahassee said that that car had too much oil in it and it whacked out their machine? What in the world does that mean? Too much oil. Okay. Let's move on. How does that mean? I don't know. Stupid. All right. Now, what you talking about on 4.7? What was that? Next year is just crap. Uh, Some about the. Where should the first possible leak be checked? All right, I'm going to turn this off so it moves a little faster because we're, oh, we're getting bogged down in the picture. We're getting bogged down in the picture. I'll turn it back on until I see a picture you need to see. Oil pressure sending unit. How many people have seen an oil pressure oh, sending unit? Number five. Huh? Number five. Number five. Is that right? 104.7 liter engine has an oil leak. Which of the following possible leak points should be checked first? It is sealed. Oil fuel tube attached. That's going to be a C, isn't it? Why don't you check the oil filler cap? What's the rule of thumb on that? You always check the stuff that's easy to check first. Now, if you've checked the easy to check stuff and that's not what the problem is, you're not done. Got it? Right. All right. Okay. Now then, let's move on over here and zip on through there. What about your gallery plug, your oil gallery plugs? There's little expansion plugs that stop up the ends of the oil gallery. Like when they drill all that stuff through there, they leave holes in the end of the box. And they, when they're drilling it, they drill it with long drills. And they have to take a little thing that looks kind of like a freeze plug and drive it up in there and it stops up an oil gallery. And it's real strong. Oil gallery plugs are on the heads and everything. you got to watch those. That don't usually happen. Oh, by the way, how many of y'all were here last time when we found that oil leak that we would have sworn was the rear main seal on that Dodge Caravan? And it turned out it was the camshaft. That little, uh, there was a rubber seal on the end of the camshaft and it was leaking from there. The rear main seal wasn't leaking at all. But uh, what I've always told you guys, if you've got the transmission out for something, hey. go ahead and pop the flywheel out and look at the uh, rear main seal. And if it's leaking, put one on there. If it's starting to see, no reason not to once you got the transmission out anyway. Correct. Uh, you don't want to put it all the way back in. Right. Well, a crankshaft position sensor, if it's going into the, uh, you know, engine, you're going to look there. Uh, if they're a bed plate design, look for oil leak between the bed plate and the cylinder block. You may have it there. So look at the rear oil seal area, you know. And I tell you, there's been a lot of rear main oil seal uh, leaks diagnosed when it wasn't the rear main oil seal. It was leaking from the oil pan, one of these Chevy pickups like to leak. And it would drip from right back there and make you think it's the rear main oil. And you remember what it was on that Dr. Crudop's uh, uh, Crown Victoria? Who worked on that one? I blew Crown Vic. Yeah. Sean did. You no. did that, didn't you? And uh, stupid oil pan gasket is what it was on there. And it was a booger bear of a job on that was. Yeah, but I mean, uh, the oil, I mean there's, no way, there's no easy way to take care of that problem. I mean, we pull the transmission and get the oil pan out. Flywheel was too dry looking for it. Yeah, well, it, it, was, it was coming apart up in there. Uh, for a transmission fluid leak, we're going to modify our top to bottom approach, and we're going to cover upper checkpoints, left side, right side, and then lower checkpoints. We're going to look at hot. Uh, let me ask you this. How many of you have ever seen a dipstick tube on a transmission leaking, making it look like a transmission oil pan leaking? It'll, it'll, yeah, it'll run down that transmission oil pan. You'll swear the oil pan leaking. When you wipe it off, then you see it's coming from the dipstick tube over here. Yeah. Seen that before. All right. Okay, you're going to check around the sensor, uh, speed sensor connector and all that stuff. Uh, you know, anything that goes into that transmission has got an o ring around it can leak. Uh, on the right side, you're going to check the cooler outlet, in the ports, lines. Oh, this is a fun story. Uh, this woman that I knew pretty well had a uh, Ford, one of the little LTDs, years and years and years ago. And this is one, of, and, I, and she took, she came in, she's an own transmission service. And I knew the car, and I knew her, but this uh, transmission mechanic did a transmission service on it. 
And so he comes in, he puts a gasket and a filter on there, just real practice deficiency. He's been doing it a lot of time. He takes that thing out of here, and it gets to the red light down here, and it starts just pouring transmission fluid like you wouldn't believe. I mean, it's pumping it out of there. So she comes back up there, and when we got up in the lift there, think one of the transmission cooler lines, which was like a flare line, like a, kind of like a brake line, it cracked right behind. Yeah. You got a half a quarter of oil that I could get to put in that van and then need, need to top it off. Oh, yeah, there is a, there's some quarts of oil sitting right there. Just pick get, you one up. Get one of them. And take the whole quart with you. Okay. If you know, yeah. Now, who did the inspection on that? Brandon Ford. That right. man that he just had to put oil in? No, it was fine when I checked it yesterday. Man, okay. Oil don't magic. That, something is bad wrong with that thing. It used to have a quart of oil in one day. Well, when you do the 15 passenger van, one of the things that a commercial driver's license person like myself is supposed to do is that vehicle inspection has got to be done before he takes anybody anywhere. The same vehicle inspection that we do has got to be done on that by the driver. And that's what he was doing. He was checking all the fluid levels. He's looking at the shocks. He's looking at the springs. He's looking at the lights. He's going to do all that stuff. Even though we check it. So yeah, there's going to be somebody know. checking behind you every time. Yes, yeah, to uh, every, every time, time yeah. before and after. Uh, Just maintenance typically checks. before, you know. But but anyway, uh, you want to check your cooler out. Oh, I don't know what I, what I was telling you. This right here, you know these lines go through, they got a flare like that, right? It's a double flare. This is a cross section. And the nut is here. This is the nut. And then, of course, the nut comes out and it's got the flats and all that stuff. And we can rub this out right here. And that's what the line looks like, right? Got that? Everybody got that? We got threads here. Is that a pretty good drawing? Did I do good on that? All right, now look at this. Right here, and I'm telling you this because you need to know it. I'm not telling you this because I'm trying to keep the thing. Right here, you'll have cracks. And you won't be able to see it. And you'll pull it off and you'll look and you'll see a problem to put it in. And where this line comes out of here, you'll see fluid coming out of here. You'll say, well, I don't see anything wrong with that. You'll cut it back in there, you'll tighten it up real good, and it leaks out here. And you know what we uh, typically do with that? What do we do with it? If you're in a bind and you ain't got time to cut that flare off and reflare it, you put some white tape. Teflon tape really tight wrapped around here and tighten that sucker back up, we'll fix it. <laughs> Temporary. But basically what you're going to do is you're supposed to cut that off and you're supposed to redouble flare it and you're supposed to put that line back on there. But that, you would not believe how common that is on something like transmission tool line of, of that type. That, you know, most of them nowadays have got different types of line. But if you see something like that, there's always a potential that you could have a split line. Now that's something right there you can take to the bank. A lot of the time you're going to run into something that you never expected to run into. And, uh, I wanted to, but that's what happened 11. Now let me ask you this. Was that transmission mechanic guilty of causing that leak? It wasn't leaking. No, he never touched the lens. It wasn't leaking before he worked on it. He pulled the pan off. He put the, he pulled it, you know, put a new gasket in the filter in there, filled it up with fluid. And it wasn't leaking when it drove out of the dealership. But this started just pouring transmission oil before he even got out of sight. Before she got out of sight. And he didn't touch that. I mean, it was way up here. It was ridiculous. I mean, but, you know, she was absolutely convinced that we did something wrong. You see, and occasionally you always have that situation, and you just, you know, you just got to cut your losses and go over Yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, the, you got dye. Let's say you're going to use dye enhancing glasses. You can use those yellow glasses uh, through Penn Star service equipment, Penn Star product. Okay. Down the dipstick in the case it's entered the system so you can begin to search for traces on and around the motor. In other words, if you pull the dipstick and you see the dial of the dipstick, you know there's all, it's all over throughout. So you use your ultraviolet light, and uh, like I said, Chelsea's done that, so there's a, you know, there's a, she's already done a work, she's on that uh, All right. If you don't find any traces of the dial, you'll take it up for road test. I have seen them where they wouldn't leak in the service bay no matter what you did. I'm telling you, you can just hope that you can have it on the rest, you can rev it up, you can do whatever you want to. It ain't going to do nothing until you take it out on the highway and you drive that darn thing for 10 miles and then you come back and you see a big leak. So what I'm saying is you can get in trouble if you got it up on the lift with the engine running and you're saying I don't see a leak because let's just clean it off and let them have it back. I don't know what the problem was. Maybe somebody spilled some oil and it ran off somewhere and they take it back and before they even get down to their you know favorite Waffle House they leak it all again. 
And you should have driven it, you know, always test drive it, sure. Yeah. But, you know. Okay, now then, we're, we're going to be, let's jump on to this next question here. Which of the following is not a possible cause of internal oil consumption? A, weak seal between the cylinder heads and block. B, worn rings. C, leak and valve guides. Or D, worn cylinders. A. Yeah, weak cylinder between the, weak seal between the cylinder heads and block is probably not, not, I'm not going to say it's not a possible cause, but it's the least likely, okay? Because, uh, you know, I told you about the, you know, pressure going up there. Okay, what's a sign of internal transmission leak? A, accelerated transmission wear or damage. Delay engagement. Yeah. Delay engagement. Shit. What are you talking about? Uh, now, wait a minute. Hold on. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. That's, a, that's low fluid. Delay engagement. Is. Uh, shifting. Right. Now, listen to Archie. He's the transmission man. For shifting problem. That's right. It's going to shift crazy. If it's leaking internally, it's losing pressure going to some of your clutches and stuff. It's not going to do that. Which of the following tests can help isolate an internal transmission leak? Compression test. <laughs> Wet compression test. Oh, that's a joke, too. Hydraulic pressure test. Uh, that's where we're going. Number nine. Technician said, and he says, aerobic sealers need air to cure properly. What's an aerobic sealer? Uh, what is aerobics? Air What's the word aerobics? Use with air. 